Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, PO Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone number 0703 0706359 0703 768198 Email address lsmedia at or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. assembly of believers has been fixed as grow in grace. And if you are conversant with the scripture, you will know that that was a phrase taken from Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. And if you look at that verse properly, you will notice that the verse started with but. Eh? But, did you see but? But grow in grace. Go to Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. That's where our theme had been taken from. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Are you there in that passage? Eh? Please go back to that passage because we are going to work on it very quickly. Now, but you see, we will not have been able to begin our study from that verse. Simply because, first, it is the end of a whole book. It is like a summary statement of the entire book. Much more, it was the last verse of a whole chapter. So it would never be completely correct to start uh, speaking from the last verse of a whole chapter without perusing what the chapter is all about. But if we could have even started at that point, the verse again started with something you don't start with. You don't start a statement with but. Do you do that? If somebody came to greet you and he said, but, what will be your immediate response? But what? And why did this start with but? You have not made a statement, you say but. So that means that the context of this particular text requires that we must go a little backward. And because the context of a text usually defines that text, we will be vague if we just begin to take a text without finding the context in which it has been placed. So we will need for this evening, no matter how briefly I can do that, we need to look at the context in which God is saying, but you grow in grace. In what context is the Holy Spirit speaking? And how do we approach the Word of God uh, in order to deal with the matter of growing in the grace of God. Now, it would have been okay if we begin to read the chapter itself, chapter 3. So I'm going to request all of you to join me as we read Second Peter, chapter 3. It's only 18 verses, and it's never a crime to read the Bible like that. Is it a crime? No. 
So you are going to read responsibly with me. When I read verse 1, I want you to read verse 2, like that, until we get to verse 18, where we shall conclude together. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. Knowing this fact, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own ways, their own love. For this, they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men can slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the works that are daring shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, will look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. On landed and on stable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Verse 18 now. But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now, and forever. Amen. May the Lord bless his word, even as we read together and as we study it in the name of Jesus Christ. Now you can see that the last verse that say, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is only coming in the context of all that we are going to be looking at as if the answer 
unto the challenge of the end time is to grow in the grace of God. Is to grow in the knowledge of God. Is to grow in your personal experience of the grace that is in Christ Jesus. But permit me this night just to peruse the context before we come back to settle on the issue of growing in grace. Why do I need to do that here tonight? Sometimes you may think that you are growing in a context that is not real. So sometimes you might think that even the church is growing simply because there's so many people that are gathering around and a lot of things are being said. Sometimes you might even imagine that a minister, a preacher, is growing and that his ministry is really growing because you are talking from a wrong context. You are not looking at what does God uh, speak about as regards what he wants us to do. Now, the entire book of Second Peter was a body that Peter had to express towards the end of his life, towards the end of his ministry, and towards the time of his departure. Actually, if I were to ask you, you will see the body in the heart of Peter. In chapter 1, he had spoken about the kind of things that we must add so that your believing, your faith, will not be fruitless. He had enumerated from chapter 1 of Second Peter, I think from verse 5 down to verse 11, he had enumerated what to look for in the life of a believer that is, that is fruitful, in the life of a believer that is growing well. He has spoken about if these things be in you and they abound. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there are things that he had listed that if these things are bound in you, if these things are present in your life, it will make you that you will neither be barren and neither will you be unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a but. He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was touched from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. So an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That was the opening introduction to this particular epistle. You know why I'm having to do that? It's because chapter 3 began by saying, this second epistle that I'm writing to you has become necessary because of the situation in which even in his own days, the church we are beginning to get into. And I want you to note all of that so that I can set the context for the need, the necessity for you and myself to keep growing in the grace of God. Chapter 1 verse 12 is a wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Do you know them and be established in the present truth. Yes, I think it meet, that is, I think it necessary, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Knowing that shortly I must put up this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ 
has already shown me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Because we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That was chapter 1. That was what prompted this letter. He said, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, even though you know them and you are established in the present truth. Yet I think it is necessary at this point. I think it is me that as long as I'm in the tabernacle and I'm still living in this body to steer you up by putting you in remembrance. Now I was looking at the body that came on a man of God like Peter. After they have labored, after they have preached the gospel, after they have set the ordinances of the word of God. And towards the end of his life, he began to see the kind of decay, the kind of contamination, the kind of wrong emphasis, the kind of things that have come into the body and into the church. And this man saying, I think it is necessary now that I must put you in remembrance of these things. Even now that I'm about to depart, I want to endeavor that I will do something that will always keep you in remembrance of this truth. And I was wondering that he said, even after my decease, after my death, I want you never to forget. So I will do something to keep this matter in your memory so that you don't miss it. Now, as I look at that, I saw a very big matter here. I saw that if the word of God is not properly preached and preserved, there are too many, many people that will try to destroy it. There are too many, many people out of their own personal interest, personal greed, personal agenda, they will try to twist the truth and make it to say what it was not meant to say. And if Peter had a very critical body to do this in his own day just before he was going to die, let me ask you, do you think we are in a less dangerous condition than that time? Talk to me, please. Eh? I will be helping you to see that quickly because this meeting, since we have decided to talk about growing in the grace of God, we will have to set it properly and trusting that in the next three days, God himself will mobilize our hearts and set you, you know, on fire such that nothing, nothing, will be able to persuade you eh, from standing upon the truth by which Christ himself laid down his life for us. Praise the Lord. He said, I think it is necessary. I think it is very, very necessary now that as long as I'm in this tabernacle to steer you up by putting you in remembrance. Knowing that shortly, I must put off this tabernacle, even as the Lord Jesus has shown me. Moreover, I must endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. And you know, he said, because we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Our faith is not about uh, some persons telling a story and they're mixing it and somebody jumping up with a personal philosophy. No. The faith has a standard. 
And if you really, really are planning to go to heaven, there's a biblical standard for it. If you really want to be a man of God, there's a biblical standard for it. If you don't want to run in vain and make a shipwreck of your faith, there's a biblical principle to follow. And it is important that we must keep re-emphasizing this even in our own day, in our own time. Now it says that no scripture has come as a matter of somebody's personal interpretation or personal uh, idea. All scriptures that were given were given by the inspiration of God. So nobody has the right either to add to scripture or to twist it or to make it a private, customized teaching. Sometimes I hear some preachers and they say, well, you know, close your Bible. There's a special word. I say, no, no, no. That is fallacy. There's no special word greater than this word. And every other preacher, for us to be sure that you are correct, you must be symmetrical with the truth. We must judge you by it. And we must you must submit yourself to the reality of the, of the word of God. Now, but in chapter 2, Peter began. He said, but there are, there were false prophets. Also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many, please mark verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2. What did he say? Many shall do what? Shall follow their pernicious way, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Just as it was then, Peter was speaking prophetically as a man of God, and he said, Many shall follow their pernicious ways. I wish somebody can help me read that verse 2 from another simpler version. Do you have any simpler version that you can read verse 2 for me? Either good news, NIV, uh, any message. Who is reading? NIV, yes. The way you are reading it, nobody will hear you like that. Yes. You see, many, not few, many shall follow their shameful way. And by that, they will bring the way of truth unto disrepute. Any other version? Please permit, permit. Are you carrying the microphone at all? Do we have a second mic that we can use to read? If you are the one carrying mic, run quickly. Thank you, sir. Right. Go to that. Baba is standing up. What version are you reading, sir? Um, NIV. Oh, we have read the, 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 the Living Bible. The Living Bible. Living Bible, all right. Yeah. Many will follow their evil teaching. Yes. That there is nothing wrong with sexual sin. Uh -huh. And because of them, Christ and his way will be scoffed at. Did you see that? He said, Many will follow their what? Their evil teachings. Whereby they are saying, There's nothing big, there's nothing wrong. With sexual immorality. And thereby, the way of the truth will be scoffed at. The way of the word of God will be dishonored. Any other version? Where is good news? What do you want to read? Eh? C-E-B. Alright. Contemporary English version. Good Thank news. you. 
Many people will follow their evil ways uh -huh. and cause others to tell lies about the true way. They will make others to look, to talk lies, to disregard the way of truth. Where is good news today? Good news. Even so, even so, many will follow their immoral ways. Uh -huh. And because of what they do, others will speak evil of the way of truth. Go on reading to verse 3. Go on reading. Let me just ask you to read that before I go ahead. In their greed, In their greed these false teachers uh -huh. will make a profit out of telling you made up stories. Uh -huh. For a long time now, their judge has been ready. And their destroyer has been wide awake. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mama. Through covetousness, they, with vain words, shall make merchandise of you. After my death, this matter will continue to be in your remembrance. The reason because just as there were false prophets among the people in those days, there shall be false teachers, false preachers. They will arise among you. They will multiply. They will be saying things, damnable heresies. They will be creeping in, you know, the, the word says, privilege. They will bring damnation. In recent times, you hear all kinds of teachers and preachers talking about grace. Grace that does not stop you from living in sin. You hear all kinds of doctrines. That when we want to stand upon the word of God to check it, it's all about money. It's all about how to get something from your pocket. He said, these people, through covetousness, they will use vain words. They will use sugar-coated words. They will use high-standing words. It will look like a new revelation. It will be standing as if this thing is just coming from heaven right now. It's a lie. Vain words. And what will they do? They will make a merchandise of you. They will make you a prey. Just to get your money. Just to take something from your pocket. And the Bible said, This man, it's not that they don't even know that judgment is awaiting them. But for them, they are not interested in going to heaven. And they are saying to themselves, let me have a good life here, even if I go to hell. Sometimes when you move near them, you will be wondering whether they fear God at all. No, 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 no. They have seared their conscience with hot iron. They, do, they, are, they are not touched. You are the one that say, ah, hey. No, 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 no. They are already insulated. They have made their heart so hard and hardened that nothing touches them. But the unfortunate thing is that you, ignorant, always impressed by every new thing, always run you up and down because somebody just said the Spirit just appeared to him now. The only answer to this is that you must grow in grace. That's what we want to be dealing with. But so that you can appreciate the need to grow in grace, that's why I am taking this kind of uh, inventory context of the passage. I just wanted to pass through it in a very short while. I'm not teaching on them because it will take us many, many weeks to be able to deal with those issues. But we can run through it as we go on together even tonight. Hallelujah. Now let's see some of what they say. Where is the Amplified Bible, please? Amplified Bible, can you read? 
That verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, if possible. Amplified, verse 2. Yes, amplified. Ampl Where are you? Uh -huh. And lascivious doings. Because of them, the true way will be maligned and defamed. And in their covetousness, lust, greed, they will exploit you with false cunning argument. Mm. From of old, the sentence of condemnation for them has not been idle. Their destruction, eternal misery, has not been asleep. For God did not even spare angels that mm. sinned. Even the angels that sinned, God did not spare them. Yes. But cast them into hell, delivering them to be kept there in pit of gloom till the judgment and their doom. And God did not spare the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that afterward should live ungodly. Now, that's the context in which these passages, this letter, this epistle was being written. If you had faith and you keep reading, can you go to verse 13? Chapter 2, verse 13. I wish you are able to just read for yourself. But let me just read and see where we can go. It said, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that can't it pleasure, they can't it pleasure to riot in the day. Spots they are and blemishes, spotting themselves with their own deceiving while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and hearts they have exercised with covetousness, with covetous practices, caused children, which have forsaken the right way, and they have gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass, speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. This, this are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they are lured through the loss of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Why they promise them liberty. They themselves, they are the slaves or they are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you following me at all? Eh? Now, this is the reason why this chapter or this particular epistle had been written. The fact that there came a point in the ministry of the church where many, many rules, many, many teachers who only reason of coming to the ministry is to make a good living out of it. Their major emphasis is how to collect money and how to eat. And if it is just that they will eat and, 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 and preach the truth, there will not have been a problem about it. But they have had their heart exercised onto corrupt practices. You know, I don't know how to put the way the scripture is talking. Say, people have exercised their heart. Have you seen uh, athletes when they wake up early in the morning and they are exercising, eh? eh? Developing their muscles and bending and stretching. 
the Bible said there are people who have made a studied practice eh, of how to exercise their heart onto covetous practices. When they are telling fantastic lies, their eyes are so strong that you will think they are telling the truth. When they want to collect money from your pocket and empty your purse, they already have a studied uh, a marketing strategy that they will use that before you know it, if you are not careful, you may even carry yourself to the altar and donate yourself and say, send me completely. They are so, they are, they are, they are in, in, in it. They are practicing it. They did not just wake up to come and say it. And they prepare their heart that nothing can touch them. When they come to preach, you think it's the word of God they came to preach. But it is you that they plan to make a merchandise of. Now, if those things, let me find out from you. Are those things happening among us nowadays? So is the book of Second Peter, is it a relevant book for us to study? If by the time Peter was dying, he said, just before I give up the ghost, I must make sure I write this down. So that even after my death, you will always remember that I told you this. If this is already happening in our day, in our time, in our environment, and some of you may even be involved in that kind of practices. Some of you might think it's a great ministry to swindle men and date them and not tell them the reality of what Jesus will have them know. Maybe you might think where well, it is correct. And that there's nothing wrong with this, and you have accepted this. This is the body that Second Peter was expressing. You know, one of the things that challenged me in the past few years, as I've been going up and down, preaching, teaching, I'm finding different things, and I'm becoming more and more restless. I'm discovering again and again and again and again that men that have given themselves unto these things, these errors, they are very aggressive. They seem to get sponsorship from, from the pit of hell. And it's as if it is a conspiracy against the way of the truth. And as if, if God will not help us, they are likely to sweep off and change everything and change definition of of Christianity, of Christian life, and produce something else that will look like a form of godliness when the power of the word of God had been denied. Now, so chapter 3. Chapter 3. You know, I told you I'm just doing a panoramic analysis of our context so that I can get to our text. So chapter 3. Are you there? This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I tear up your pure mind by way of remembrance. Some of the issues that God wants us to speak about, it's not that you did not know about it, but your spirit, your mind has to be steered back. Your pure mind has to be steered up again. So that you might be alert, you might be sensitive, you might make correct choice, you might decide to walk with God on the way that is pleasing. When I'll be dealing with the ministers, the clergy tomorrow, we shall be looking at fighting the good fight of faith. Because this thing would, will require fighting. <laughs> Are you hearing me? This is going to be a very serious battle for the kingdom of God. If we are not going to lose the revival that God has released to us, if we are not going to become big, if the will of the Lord is not going to be discredited, 
Sometimes as I travel anywhere, it's just correct for me just to remain as I have always been. If anybody mistakenly wants to introduce me and say, this man is pastor, my God, then you become a suspect. That's what I've discovered. In those days earlier, when you get to immigration and you say, I am a man of God, a preacher, they say, welcome, sir. And they release you. But now, when you say you are a man of God, they say, yes, it is people like you, we need to check thoroughly. Sometimes I have been kept, you know, at immigration waiting, simply because once they saw the green passport, and they said, this man is also a preacher, they said, ah, they are the ones that came to our country and ravaged our people. I said, no, I'm not one of them. No, 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 are you not the same? You are all preachers. Something has happened that is discrediting the way of truth and is bringing the honor of the word of God and of our God onto the mud. And men are trampling upon the truth because of the practices of these men and women that have crept into our midst. They have come into our ordination. They have, they have, they have found their way into the pulpit, and it's as if they have the audacity to set up their pulpit anywhere they like. And because the church is generally unable to withstand and say no, they seem to be making progress. But I hear the Lord saying, "Rise and fight." The good fight of faith at a time like this. I discovered that what Peter was talking about, if you go to the book of Jude, you see Jude saying the same thing. When you go to the book of uh, 1 John, you see John also writing about the same thing. When you leave that and you go to Revelation, you see the Holy Spirit speaking about the same thing. This matter is serious. For Jesus, before he left, go and look at all that he began to speak, you realize that he did not keep quiet about it. When Paul was writing 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, you saw him speaking very deliberately about this matter. Because they saw that the end time would be more difficult. They saw that it would become more difficult to be genuine Christian in the end time. That's why you have to grow in grace. You have to grow in the knowledge of God. You have to be a man that will not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Praise the Lord. Are you with me? This second epistle, Beloved, I now write unto you in both which I tear up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this fact, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, working after their own lust. Did you hear that? Knowing this fact, that there shall in the last days come scoffers, walking after their own lot, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And you will notice that one of the general things that began to happen at the beginning of this uh, avalanche of men that have eroded the puppet was a deliberate attempt to discredit the teaching and the preaching of the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Then I began to hear my colleagues in those days said, some of you, you are heavenly minded and earthly useless. And I hear them say, ever before we go to heaven, we must enjoy the earth. 
that was the beginning of it. I thought they were saying that only to correct and over emphasis. Emphasis that made many of us who are believers to continuously remind ourselves that this word is not our own. And so because we did not understand that even though the word is not our own, we are going to be the light of the world, we are going to be the source of the earth. And we need to make sure that we cause the kingdom of God to be established while we are here. I thought that that was what they were trying to balance out. Only for me to describe that they were doing that in preparation to make the people of God forget that there is heaven to go. All of you sitting before me, how many times in the past five years have you had anybody doing a very serious, consistent exposition in all the churches that you have been going about the coming of Jesus Christ? Talk to me, please. This was a message that we could never finish a quarter without reminding the brethren, we say, Maranatha. Actually, when we are about to finish any service, just when we, like now, I see the way we, we finish our service, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, eh? and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Then the next thing I hear you say now, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You know that's what we now do. That was a replacement. That was a replacement of the biblical greeting that the apostles established. When you have shared the grace, the next thing to say is, Maranatha, Maranatha, the Lord is coming. Please prepare for his coming. If we don't see before our next meeting, I'll see you in heaven. Maranatha, 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 Maranatha. That's how we greeted ourselves. But gradually, it was removed. It was steadily done, so that many of you that are just born again now, you are not aware that we are going to heaven. All your prayers have to have breakthroughs. All the night pages is how to break through. Breakthrough to where? It is done deliberately. That that which sets your heart, your affection on things above and not on things below, was technically removed. Technically pushed aside. Such that you can be in church for five years. Nobody has told you about the second advent. Nobody has told you that this world is passing away. And that the thing there is. And that only those who do the will of God will abide forever. Nobody is telling you, love not the world and the things that are in the world. In fact, somebody is saying, love the world. Love the world and make the most of the world. Make yourself great in the world. That's the kind of messages that has dominated our time, our television. When I turn and I want to listen to something that will edify my soul, I just see soothsayers, motivational speakers, repeating themselves, tearing up the greed of your heart, drawing your heart onto the things that will soon pass away. Now it was deliberate. It was. It was the. It was the conspiracy of the kingdom of darkness that is coming upon the body of Christ. And for this reason he said, I'm writing this second epistle because first there shall come in these last days coffers walking after their own loss. They are saying, where is the promise of his coming? When they meet people like us, they say, you're a terrorist. Why do they call me a terrorist? Say, so you terrify people about going to heaven. You terrify people about going to hell. Every time you preach,
spirit about sin. You make people to cry. Let's make people laugh. Let's say that they have no problem. And as I read again and again the word of God, I found that right from ages, this kind of spirit has always been there to attack the work of God. Even when you read Isaiah, when you read Jeremiah, you hear God saying, the prophet, the shepherd, they have committed evil. They are treating my people's wound as if it is a light thing. They are telling them there's nothing, there's nothing, even though the people are going to perish. Just so that they can make their own money. This second epistle is necessary because of these prevailing issues among us. For this, they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. And the earth stood out of the water, in the water, whereby the word that then was being overflowed with water perished. I hope you remember that there was a world before this one. Do you remember that? There was an earth before this one. There was the days of Noah. When people became reckless. When iniquity was abandoned. They were given in marriage. They were receiving. There was birthday parties. All of it was going on. And it was going on and on and on. And God raised a Noah to preach. Noah was preaching the preacher of righteousness. God told him, prepare an ark for the salvation of your house. He made the ark. He preached about it and said, come into this. God is going to destroy this world. They say, a lie. They laughed. Even as I'm preaching here, there are people who are laughing at me here. When you say, I, I went for a meeting, they say, you have gone there again? We tell you to come and hear something that will make you great. They make you feel as if thinking seriously about eternity, thinking seriously about how to please God, thinking seriously on how to walk with God in righteousness, as if it's old-fashioned, as if it's something that is something to, to be very careful about. All because, these men have established themselves to impose themselves. They are more popular in the midst of God's people than God himself. We fear them more than we fear Jesus Christ. Am I communicating with you? How did we come into all of this? They kept telling you that there's no judgment coming. But they forgot. They were willingly ignorant that there was a word of Noah. And there was nothing else that God, that made God to destroy it except sin, except reckless living, except misbehavior. Now, someone may say, well, you are reading Old Testament. May I inform you that this is in the New Testament? Is this in the New Testament? All right. And these are preached by preachers of the new covenant. These are the instructions that the apostles, apostles of the Lamb, they could not die until they explained it, until they wrote it. Because of the fear of the Lord that gripped their heart and said, Kai, the way men are going, I must write something to keep you constantly in remembrance. Praise the Lord. These men, they capitalize on the long suffering of the Lord. As if that meant that God was not going to do what he said. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. You see? Is God slack? As some men can slackness. But God is long suffering towards us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should do what? Should come to repentance. If God seemed to have been patient 
And if God seemed to have continuously withdrawn and, and, and waited, it was not slackness. It was that God, in his compassionate heart, does not want any man to perish, but that he wants to give everyone opportunity to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. Brothers, the day of the Lord will do what? Will come. As a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fire and heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. This is going to happen. And sometimes you see a little glimpse of it, and you wonder why men are not going to think. There are several things, hurricanes, strange fires, that even computer will predict it. Am I right? They will say, this thing is coming, it will hit this place at this time, it will get to that place at this time, this is the speed with which it is coming. But they can't stop it. Have you noticed that even though they knew it was coming, they couldn't stop it. And right in their very eyes, they saw lives wasted. They saw men swept away. They plan and plan and plan and plan and say, well, we know it's coming. Let's plan. Let's arrange. When the last one hit some portion of, uh, of Florida, one of our friends, a missionary, was writing, said, Bragbile, please pray. The thing is going to hit our city by so, so, so hour. I am trying to pack everything out. We are climbing on top of uh, the roof so that the thing will not touch us. They knew it, but they can do nothing about it. Let me tell you, when the time of the prophecies will come to pass, it is not as if the computer may not pick it, they will pick it, but they can't stop it. Dearly beloved, knowing that this thing will happen, that the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fire and heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons, what manner of men and women ought you to be in all holy Conversations, the word conversation is not about talking. No, all manner of holy living. Knowing that this thing will be dissolved. Friends, take note of this. Even if preachers no longer tell you and tell you that you are going to be here and that everything is going to work on, Never you forget, let your pure mind be scared. Let your inner man be woken up. Remind yourself and be reminded again that these things will dissolve. But if to say we know that on so slow days and so slow hour it will happen, then we can be say, okay, let's try, let's try, let's try. I even tell you now that even if you were to know you may not be able to help yourself. You may not be able to do anything about it. You just... You will only be watching what you cannot undo. Now, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversations and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, 
we, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth where in dwells righteousness. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So now, wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, I don't know whether you are looking for such things. Are you looking for the heavens? Eh? Are you looking for his appearing? I'm not hearing you very well. Are you among those of us who continuously remember that this world is not our own? You know, I was touched. I, was, I don't know what's happening to me the other time. I was looking at the word of God. And I remember that when we were studying scriptures in those early days, in the early 70s, and we're talking about what will happen towards the end time. There was no computer at that time. No computer. We never expected digital technology. So when we are studying the word of God, that a time is coming, when you will not be able to buy or sell without a number. Eh? Are you hearing me? Without a number. We were wondering. We believed it. But we did not know how it was going to be. We stood. We said, God, I will not take the number. I will not take the number. We didn't know what we bring about number. As we are sitting here now, let me ask you. Can you withdraw any money from the bank now without your BVN? I hope you know that what matters now is not about your name. Who knows what matters now? Your PIN number. PIN number. If you miss your PIN number, your money is locked up. As we are talking now. As we are talking now, you know our world is going cashless. All of these were the prophecies that we were knowing in those days. But we never imagined that it was going to be like that. But you are unaware, you are sitting as if, as if the days are not running. You are living as if we are not at the end of time. Can you imagine that as we're talking now? All the world is talking about now. A brother visited me one time and he brought one small gadget. Then I did not know that, that the development is beginning. The geophysics, what you now call the GPS, and all that thing that is in your phone. Eh? And he came to my compound, he said, Bragule, let's just see where you are. And he punched and punched and punched. And I saw the picture of my house, everything. So when I went to visit him in the U.S., I was with him in Houston, Texas. He said, Bragule, do you want to know what's going on in your compound? I said, how? Then he brought out his uh, phone and he punched, 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 punched. And all the trees in my compound, all my house, my children that were sitting under the mango trees, I saw them. Say, so can we get into your bedroom and see what is going on there? I know, I know, some of it's, it's, it's useful. Is it not useful that you can sit here and you are Skyping and your son that is in uh, Australia? He said, Mom, do you want to see your grandchildren? And he went and Skyped and he showed them to him. He said, Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you are greeting. All of this, very wonderful. But prophecy told us about it before. That a time is coming when a man will stand somewhere and he will speak once and the whole world will hear him at once. Is it happening now? You know, as I'm talking now, somebody is streaming this message. And somebody in UK, somebody in Australia, they are seeing me here. And before we finish, somebody will call you and say, Oh, I was in that meeting where Brother Gile was speaking. 
Digital technology is only confirming prophecy. It's only showing us that what God said will happen, will happen. It's already happening. And as I'm looking at how things are running, I hope you realize now that the world is going micro. Eh? Have you noticed that they are going now very, very micro? And they are making sure now that when you get what you call ATM now, there's an ATM that carries everything about you. Anything, anything, anything about you, all your information. How I went, I just landed in Canada one day with my wife, and we wanted to pass immigration, and the young man just punched his, uh, his uh, system, and my face came out, and then he greeted me. He said, yes, how is your son that is in the UK? I look at my wife. I said, how did they know? Is there anything about you that they, they have not captured? So when we talk about one man, world government, and the word of God told us about it, the prophecies in the book of Daniel, we were wondering how will it be? But technology has only confirmed prophecy. My brothers, my sisters, the reason why I am doing this general preamble tonight is to set a context for the need for you to grow in grace. When we talk of growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, we are not just talking empty slogans. You need to grow in the grace of God. You need to be well established so that you will not be swept away. You need to know whom you have believed so that you will not find yourself on the other side, even inside church. You need to know what are the peculiarities of our faith so that men with sugar-coated mouths Men that have gone to study how to speak with high-sounding, high-sounding philosophy will not make a merchandise of your life and rob you of your opportunity that God has offered you in Christ Jesus. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom God given to him, has written unto you. So I say to you that whether Paul, whether Peter, whether Jude, whether John the Apostle, all of them could not sleep until they have put this matter down because they knew that the danger of the end time is so real. And to us, to whom the end of the world has come, how much more we need to be very, very deliberate, very diligent to make sure that if the law will come, if the trumpet will sound, if it will come like a thief in the night, you will not make a shipwreck. You will not have run your race in vain. You will not have been caught in the web that is tying many people down to the earth. Now, you therefore, beloved, verse 17, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also be led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Because there is great possibility and tendency that those who used to stand before can be swept. Wonderful preachers, can be misled. When I see all means by which men want to raise money now, violating the simple scripture, 
you know that we are not redeemed by silver or gold, Abi, but by the the blood of the Lamb and by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. These are the things by which God redeemed our soul. But again and again I see that in our time there seems to be a wave that is saying you can redeem yourself with some amount of money. You can redeem your son with some money. It doesn't matter how great the preachers appear. When it is not congruent with the word of God, we must contend, must stand. I want to ask you this night, but you grow in grace. But you do what? Grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forevermore. Now, what is that exhortation? Grow in grace. I'm not going to start dealing with that topic now. I just want to prepare you. We are now coming to the point. That with all the challenges that we are going to see, with all the things that is already happening in our generation, with all the troubles, with all the contamination and corruption, doctrines are being corrupted. Simple word of God are being twisted. All this, are the things that the word of God said will happen. So knowing this first, there shall be scoffers. There shall be men that will creep in into the, into the, into the household of faith. Uprooting unstable women. Confusing the unstable. Laying much more body on their life than Jesus Christ would want them to carry. When that book was finished and Brother John, I mean Brother Peter was going to end it, he said, but you do what? Grow in grace. And in what? In the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let me show you something more before I leave. When John was going to conclude his letter, 1 John chapter 5. Look at what he also said. After he has written about all the Antichrist that will come into the world and all that they will be saying and all the confusion that will come at the end, he said. And we know that the Son of God is come and has given us an understanding. 1 John 5.20 That we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, do what? Keep yourself from idols. When you go to Jude, after Jude also had taken time to write, he himself said, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you knew this thing before. These are men that they will not go to sleep unless they will steer the mind of believers and those that want to make it to glory. Now look at the conclusion. Look at his own conclusion in verse 23. No verse 20 please. But beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, pray in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some, have compassion, making a difference. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To him, the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty. You see, I noted that all of them, the only panacea, the only answer is that you will grow how? In grace. 
that you will build up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That you will keep yourself from idols. That you keep yourself from this modern, modern idolatry. Modern idols that has been invented and is being presented as if it was the correct thing even to the body of Christ. And so this night, as I bring this meeting to a conclusion for tonight, just as an introduction, the issue we are going to be raising are much, but this is a preamble to give us context. Grow in grace. So when we come back, I will now be looking at what are the parameters of growing in the grace of God. What are the provisions for growing in the grace of God? And what are the definiteness of the growing in the grace of God that God wants to launch you into? But tonight, beloved, I want to ask you, the time in which we are and the situation in which we have come and the overwhelming outburst of men and women who seem to have lost their allegiance with our Lord and our Savior. Who have lost focus on the man of Calvary and whose reason for being the ministry is to make a big name, is to establish their ego, and to make a good living out of it at your own expense. If it was just at the expense of your money, I would not worry, because even if you don't spend your money, somebody should spend it for you. I will not worry about that. But it is at the expense of your soul. If it is just your money they are collecting, I will not bother. Because I don't bother about that. But the fact that you are even being told damnable heresies, you are being given the kind of doctrine that insulates your heart from the fear of God, that is making you feel you are making it when you are actually descending into perdition unconsciously. The fact that men are standing up and speaking so bogusly and with boldness, as if they are speaking authoritatively from God, and yet what they are saying is not founded on Scripture. It's founded on some ideas, some high-standing motivational speaking, and they find one or two Bible verses just to wrap it, so that you will say, yes, 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 yes. But that's not the whole counsel of God. I want to put it before you tonight. Do you love your soul? Do you want to make it to glory? Do you want the death of Jesus Christ never to be a waste over your life? Then grow in grace. Grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's a way to grow in His knowledge. And that's what we are about to do. But tonight... I would have loved to say, come until tomorrow before we start praying. But knowing that the day of the Lord is like a thief in the night. The person you see today, you may not see him tomorrow. Has it happened? Eh? Has it happened? I'm still sorrowing in my heart that someone just left home I'm going to attend a friend's wedding. His wife and baby, they said, till you come. And there and then, sitting down in the comfort where supporting a friend's wedding, bandit came and killed him with a matchet. What of all the plans finished? What of all the arrangements scattered? If to say, I can have assurance that I will see you even next year, I will say, well, take your time. Whenever you are ready to hear this thing, 
And whenever you are ready to make things right with God, come. You always have the time. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure that this opportunity God is giving you may not be the last. I'm not sure that this is not the day that God has ordained to visit you as a person and to do a new thing in your life and to prepare you for the days of glory. How could we be so presumptuous when we do not have tomorrow in our hands? Is it not by the grace of God that we will see tomorrow? Eh? It happens to preachers. It happens to anybody. One of our top leaders in the faith some years ago he came back for a meeting and he had visitors and he was conducting his visitors around his house and he was showing them things and suddenly he slumped and he died. And the whole equation changed. Everything about the ministry changed. I said, Lord, how does that happen? No notice. We didn't know that this man is going and he's just talking now and suddenly he was gone. Friends, knowing that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, what manner of men ought you to be? What manner of men, what manner of persons ought you to be? What manner of men ought you to be, my friend, as we pray tonight? Even before we will begin all the meticulous study that we need to do, I just need to ask, can you not make sure that your life is right with God tonight? Can you not allow us to be sure that even if we cannot conclude this solemn assembly, you are already all right. Can we not be sure and let us be sure that there is nothing between you and the Savior? There's nothing standing between your soul and the Savior. There's no unconfessed sin that may strangulate you, that may make you to miss all that heaven wants to give you. Can we not ensure tonight and say, Lord, even though I'm hoping that you give me grace to be able to see more and more of the coming days, can we not ensure that even tonight, Lord, let me be found standing right before you. And yet, what does it cost you to make your life right? Simple. Just simple. To come before him and say, just as I am without one plea. That loss that is warring with your soul. Father, I don't want to sleep with it tonight. I don't want to go out of here not sure of what may happen. Lord Jesus, whatever it is that stands between me and you, let's set to the matter tonight. Let's set to the matter tonight. If we see that all these things are happening left and right around us, Strange things that we never imagined. Our generation is the generation to which we witness all that God is speaking about. We are beginning to see it. Suddenly, we are having men who are rising. I never thought in my lifetime that people will begin to argue that men should marry men. It's not that we did not know in those days that there were people that were spoiling themselves with men. We read about it, we preach about it. But it never occurred to us that a time will come in my lifetime that men will march to the altar with another man. And they will be insisting that a priest will join them. Sodom and Gomorrah did not go to that extent. We never thought 
that two women will be pretending to be a husband and wife and they will want to adopt children. It never occurs to us that curriculum will be changed. And educational curriculum is changed now. And small children, three years, four years, five years, they are being told of alternative sex. They are told that you can be a man, you can be a woman, and you can be in between. And if you like, you can change. If you, anytime you don't like to be a girl again, you can become a man. I never expected that in my generation, educational, educational system would be changed to include such, such corrupt ideas. So that a generation will now grow not knowing what the truth is. As in Jesus said, unless God will cut short the day, even the elect. Tonight, I want you to rise with me in prayer. I want you to check is there any issue? Is there any matter? That must be settled between you and the Savior tonight? Is there any secret thing that you need to say, God, don't let me be a victim. Don't let something rob me of the promise that you have made to my life. Don't let me narrowly miss what could have been my inheritance. Please, as you rise, I want you to pray with me. We are in the end time. The days are evil. All kind of men have arisen. All manner of messages. When you go on the YouTube, you hear all kind of things. Digital technology has made everything look like that. The whole world is shrinking. Knowing what manner of men we ought to be. Would you like to pray and say, Lord, tonight, even if it's the only meeting I could attend, you are calling my soul. You are recharging my heart. You are drawing me back. You are setting a contest why I must grow. Why I can no longer be superficial in my knowledge. You are setting the contest why I can no longer be casual. Why I need to check everything and find out whether it be of the Holy Ghost. Would you like to please pray for yourself this night? That as this meeting is drawn to a conclusion this night, the Holy Spirit will not let you go missing. He said they will preach that there is nothing wrong with immorality. They will say it doesn't matter. I hear people telling you about grace, that grace, grace. Once you have grace, you can live anyhow. They are making you to feel that the problem is not sin, but your evil, your guilty conscience, that your conscience is weak, that you don't need to be afraid. They are painting the love of God as, as if it is it is a love that does not have any form of discipline. And maybe you have imbibed it. Can you pray tonight? Lord, don't allow me to be trapped. Don't allow the fear of God to win out of my heart. Don't allow me to miss what belongs to me. Thank you, Father. Thank you tonight. Holy Spirit, as we conclude this meeting this night, will you please move in our midst? Will you please bring restoration? Will you bring personal revival? Will you also, God, arise that in this generation there will arise men and women who contend for the faith? There will be men and women who are standing for the truth and who will not buy error. Lord, please help me tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Holy Spirit, please walk in our midst tonight. 
please tear off our pure mind. Tear off our pure mind. Lord, I'm praying that hearts that are becoming, becoming weak, those that are beginning to compromise, tear off their pure minds tonight. Wake them up again. Oh God, sharpen their heart again. Are there people whose conscience are no more sharp and sensitive? Incessant, incessant misbehavior has made their conscience to be dead. Lord, tonight I ask you to please sharpen this conscience. So that they can not make a shipwreck of their faith. Holy Spirit, walk in this meeting tonight. Do something deliberate amidst us tonight. Cause disciples to arise among us again. Men who stand for the truth. Men who are ready to die for the truth. Men who are ready to contend for the faith. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, we are praying.